keeping it real. Much of the ancient world was wrong, thinking that the sun and the moon were gods, and the Bible was right, at least in this minor point, that they're for lights. Um, no, I don't think so. You can't I admit that. The ancient world was very aware that these were lights. Well, yeah, but they were worshiping them as gods. Well, some some did, some didn't. Some worshipped trees and rocks. Uh, well, and I, I understand that. I said much of the ancient world was worshiping these things, like Egypt, for example, and, and their what was their sun god's name? Amun Re, I think. And uh, and they had a god that chased him across the sky and would bring the darkness. Okay. Yep. And my point is, and I, I'm surprised that you wouldn't concede this, that at least on this minor point that the cosmology of the Bible is right, that they are not gods, they're, they're lights. Yeah, but that, that's not a correct cosmology, it's just a different interpretation. Well, well, what's incorrect about saying they're not gods, the sun is a light, it's not a god? What's incorrect about that? They're not light. Oh, the sun is not a light. Oh. The sun does not give light to the earth. It, it generates light as a product of uh, fusion. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but so the sun is not a light? But I'm not sure where this is going, I don't get any of this, what, what is it? Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Bob Enyar. We have a guest for today's show who is the founder of Skeptic Magazine. He's also the director of the Skeptic Society. He writes a monthly column for Scientific American. He's the host of the Skeptics Lecture Series at Caltech. And this gentleman has his uh, uh, degrees in psychology and a Ph.D. in history of science, the history of science, his name is Michael Shermer. I want to welcome Michael to the program. How are you, Michael? Oh, hi. Fine. I'm fine. When I read through your bio, I told our producer here that we've got the real McCoy on the other end of the line. Uh, you have really been in the battle regarding uh, the issue of skepticism, does God exist, and I want to thank you for coming on the show. Oh, sure. Happy to be on. I've got a, a, to start off with a quick question. I see that you've written a few books, one of them, Why People Believe Weird Things. Great title, and it reminds me of a book I was wondering if you're familiar with. It's a it's a classic, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Of course, Charles McKay. It's great. It's classic. Yeah. 1841. I was I I worked for McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Company for a while. I was in the simulation department, and an engineer in the in the company in our department, uh, he was an atheist, and I believe in Jesus Christ and the Bible, and so he gave me that book to read. And I opened it up to 740 pages and popular delusions and the madness of crowds. And he was saying, Bob, read this and you'll see where you've gone wrong. <laughs> and I read the book and apparently he didn't because it's a fascinating book about how people will believe the most absurd things. Very well documented. But the thing is that Charles McKay was a Christian. And through the book, I marked his references to his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, I forgot the impression that that book uh, uh, had anything to do with religion. Well, actually, it wasn't. It was about the foolish things. The, it's a classic about the madness of crowds, popular delusions. And it is a classic on how people uh, get so easily deluded. And the clarity of the author, I attribute to the fact that he was a Christian. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. But uh, he was a great writer, and, and uh, he touched on a lot of... Uh, important subjects of mm. stuff that people believe and I, I guess you're what you're getting at here is is the question does believe in is believing in god a a, a a weird thing and the answer is well it just depends on on to what extent you you take your belief and and uh, what do you base it on and, and and so on i don't really put it in a in a weird category i'm mainly interested in the psychology of belief and how people come to believe whatever it is they believe and so if you take religion, for example, the number one predictor of, of any religious belief somebody holds is the geographical location on the earth in which they are born and yes. the epoch in which they are born. Mm -hmm. You were born 5,000 years ago in uh, you know, India. Well, you wouldn't believe any of this stuff. You never even heard of Jesus Christ. There, there was no right. religion. There was no, no even Jewish religion. Nothing. You'd believe something completely different. So... Of course, you wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ, and we have some idea from the earliest uh, surviving documents of early man and civilization recorded history tells us that, that they had religious beliefs, 
and they typically would make sacrifices to their gods, whether they were animal gods or the sun, the moon, and the stars. And uh, would you would you agree with this observation, Michael Shermer, that uh, the Bible from the first page on says, do not worship the sun, the moon, or the stars. They're not gods. They're lights. Uh, it, actually, it says a lot more than that, too. It's, well, I agree, but would you agree that it says the sun, moon, and stars are, are not gods, that they're lights, they were given for lights, so don't worship them? I, I don't remember seeing anything about that. Um, it, it says the first, the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Clearly, there were a lot of uh, uh, gods around at the time, and so uh, the particular Judeo god that, that one small group of people in the in the Levant believed, uh, you know, they said, look, this, this is the number one God. Well, everybody believes their God's the number one God. Michael? So, uh, um, what sets, the question is, what sets yours apart? Uh, anyway, as we go through... No, I, I asked a different, Michael, I asked a question, and uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, God is talking about this, the sun and the moon, and he says, let them be for lights. And I could give you a number of quotes uh, in the scriptures that, that says these things are lights, and it puts down those as incorrect who worship them as gods. So would you at least consent that the Bible, while much of the ancient world was worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars, the Bible said that they are lights? Here's what it says. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days, and for years, and let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. It doesn't say anything about not worship, worshiping them. No, I said Genesis 1, <laughs> Genesis 1 says that they're for lights, and then I said that I could go through hey, what, what the this scriptures. Got to do anything? Well, I'm just asking you a question. If you would agree that the, while much of the ancient world was saying the sun and the moon and the stars were lights, the scripture was saying don't worship them. Yeah, so? Okay, well, that's that's just one aspect of biblical yeah, cos- it cosmology. It doesn't say don't worship them. Where does it say that? I have the Bible right here. Tell me where it says don't worship them. Okay. Well, how about this? Uh, as we go, oh, now you're going to change the subject. No, I'm not. <laughs> I have the Bible here. I have my own Bible. I've had since I was a child. <laughs> Presented in 1963 <laughs> when I was nine years old. So let's go through it. Where does it say that? Okay. Let's see. Uh-huh. Uh, I I made the statement that in Genesis one. It, it says that the sun and the moon and the stars are lights. There's nothing about moon. It's just, just the lights in the sky. Well, there's the greater light and the lesser light to light the day and the night. Okay, so let me, let me think. Let me page through my Bible here. <laughs> and, and then I made the statement that later on in the Bible, we find out that the sun and the moon and stars are for lights and do not worship them. But are you saying that the, the Hebrew or Christian scriptures says that it, it, it's okay to worship the stars, or do they condemn all forms of worship other than the Creator God? I believe the latter. Okay, right. Stop the tape, stop the tape. Hey, this is Bob Enyard. This interview was two years ago, on March 5th, 2001, and now it's August 28th, 2003, and I remember after this show... I was a bit upset with myself because I couldn't just pick a Bible verse out of my head to answer his question. I knew there was one there, and we got emails, and my staff said, Bob, Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19, is the verse that Michael Shermer was perhaps doubting existed. But this is where Moses is quoting God saying, Take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them. God says, Take heed, don't do that. Do not do that. Only worship the Lord your God, the creator of the heavens. So I am glad that Michael Shermer had already admitted that the Bible teaches only worship the creator, don't worship the sun, the moon, or the stars. But there's the verse he was giggling about that did not exist. So Deuteronomy 4, verse 19. And now let's rejoin this two-year-old interview in progress. What has this got to do with anything? Well, I'm pointing out the cosmology of the ancient Hebrew scriptures that while much of the world was worshipped— See, I would think, Michael, that this is such a minor point that you would agree with it in a minute— 
I, that, I don't know what the point is. Well, that uh, I'll say it a third time, that much of the ancient world was worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the Bible said that they're for lights. They're lights, and only worship the Creator, don't worship the creation. Well, I think you're reading between the lines. Would you agree with that or no? Oh, no, I think you're reading between the lines. Okay, what part of that do you think yeah, is I, I incorrect? Think what, what, I, I'm trying to get at the larger point here. What's the larger point, that you, you guys are right and everybody else was wrong? No, no I'm, I may, I'd rather not run before we could walk. I'm wondering if, if you could admit that on that part of the cosmology of the Bible— uh, much of the ancient world was wrong, thinking that the sun and the moon were gods, and the Bible was right, at least in this minor point, that they're for lights. Um, no, I don't think so. You can't uh, admit I, that. The ancient world was very aware that these were lights. Well, yeah, but they were worshiping them as gods. Well, some some did, some didn't, some worshiped trees and rocks. Uh, well, and I, I understand that. I said much of the ancient world was worshiping these things, like Egypt, for example, and, and their what was their sun god's name? Amun Re, I think, and uh, and they had a god that chased him across the sky and would bring the darkness. Okay, yep. And my point is, and I, I'm surprised that you wouldn't concede this, that at least on this minor point, that the cosmology of the Bible is right, that they are not gods, they're, they're lights. Yeah, but that that's not a correct cosmology, it's just a different interpretation. Well, well, what's incorrect about saying they're not gods, the sun is a light, it's not a god? What's incorrect about that? They're not lights. Oh, the sun is not a light. Oh. The sun does not give light to the earth. It, it generates light as a product of uh, fusion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But so the sun is not a light? But I'm not sure where this is going. I don't get any of this. What, what is it? Uh, I mean, if you lived 10,000 years ago, my point was you wouldn't believe any of this. So uh, it, your entire belief system is based on the fact that you were born in a certain area at a certain time and that your parents were most likely Judeo-Christian, uh, or at least Christian of some kind, um, and that uh, you were raised to believe, and so on. These are the predictors of what people believe. Yeah, I, I agree with that. My father was an agnostic. My mother was a Catholic who was not very committed to her church. And in high school, I became a Christian and started studying. Uh, I'd grown up with a fascination for science and evolution, started studying the Bible, and tried to understand it all myself. And my parents were pretty upset about the change in my life. Uh, okay, let's maybe change the topic then, Michael. You have a Ph.D. in the history of science. Uh -huh. I've got a, a question for you. Um, and maybe we did a research project here, and perhaps you can tell me if you think our, at least our methodology was reasonable. We wanted to find out about the fathers of the physical sciences whether they were men who defended a natural explanation of origins or who rejected that and defended a belief in creationism. So we gathered a list from before and after Darwin, the fathers of the physical sciences from before and after Darwin, and we filled my office with probably about 100 books of uh, uh, as we could beg, borrow, or steal these books from public libraries or buy them. And I also got in my office... Uh, friends uh, who would read through, and I read through, and we began to collect their quotes. And what we found out is that uh, most of the fathers of the physical sciences, both before and after Darwin, rejected a natural explanation of origins and defended creationism, and most of them biblical creationism. What do you think of that observation? Is that, is that accurate, or did we miss the point? I'd say pre-Darwin, that's fairly accurate, yes. So, Michael, the, the basic point I was making, that scientific, uh, the greatest scientific minds of, of history have not been antithetical to the Bible's Some are, creative. some aren't. Come on, you can't right. make that kind of general. Well, well, In any case, you're basing your faith on what some 19th century uh, scientist believes? No, no, but what my... point of all this. My, Michael, some it. are and some not. My point is... The, the majority of the fathers of the physical scientists rejected natural explanations and defended creationism. Well, now, no. Is that an accurate statement or no? It's not an accurate statement, no. Nope. Okay, well, I, I've got a list in front of me that's pretty long. Yeah, of, but the list is meaningless. Well, well it not, it's not meaningless to my point. My point was that the fathers of the physical sciences, uh, the, the vast majority of them defended creationism. 
Now, is that an accurate statement? You have a Ph.D. in the history of science. But you're calling creationism is not what they would consider to be creationism. Well, I have quotes from them. If, if I've mentioned any scientists that you think that I've misrepresented, where they... I mean, it's, it's a, <laughs> this is so silly. I can't believe you make this argument. Okay, well, the, the argument is that many of the sure. greatest scientific okay, minds believe in evo evolution. believe in creation. And there was no evolution. So Well, after Darwin. That's why I said after Darwin. Before Darwin. Everybody believed in creationism before Darwin. So what? That's not true. That's not true. Evolution goes back to the ancient Greeks. Point of all this. In a belief that we've evolved out of the sea. Are you trying to argue that you have scientific proof that your that you that your religion is correct? That of the ten thousand religions in the world today, yours is the one and only one that's correct, and all the others are wrong. No, I'm not trying to argue that. I'm trying to argue that, that you can. Re Here's the point: that you can reach the pinnacle of scientific learning, and still affirm a belief in the Bible's in the Creator of the Bible. That's true. Okay. That's it. It was hard to get that, but thank you for agreeing with that. Now, I, I have quite a few arguments that I believe show that there's a creator God. Um, I would be happy to go with you either way. For you, Would you like to present arguments that there is not, or would you like to, and then I respond, or would you like no, me to give you some I, arguments? I cover all this in, in uh, my book, How We Believe. Mm -hmm. there, are, uh, there is no possible way to prove scientifically that there is or is not a God. I disagree with that. I cannot prove to you that there is no creator, there is no God. But I can do this. I can show you how religion and belief in God is socially constructed and psychologically developed. It happens historically. Well, obviously that's true, Michael. By, as I said, the time of, of the... Uh, 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 the epoch in which you're born, the place on the planet in which you're born. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you're a Yanomamo living in Brazil, uh, you're not going to believe, you're not going to be a Christian, you're not going to believe in right. uh, the Bible. Sure. Okay. So clearly... That's true. And Michael, I could show you that evolution had uh, social developments that in, in some ways it went kicking and screaming against the science of mathematics and genetics. But yet there was a strong social desire to explain our origins apart from a god, and so it had a tremendous amount of steam behind it. Right? Couldn't I show that also? Mm -hmm. um, the history of evolutionary thought is an interesting one. Um, it, 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 it hit much resistance throughout the earliest part of the 20th century until uh, genetics started to catch up a, a, with paleontology, and there was a corroboration between different independent fields in which there was a... Uh, a uh, sort of convergence of evidence toward the conclusion that evolution happened. I mean, when okay, you, you just th you think, oh my God, this really happened. Okay, you just so for people to believe because it's such a long time frame, it's not on a human time scale, and most people actually don't know that much about evolution. They right, sure. Get it from bits and pieces here and there, but it's a you know it's a full science and so on. But I imagine you've read. Oh, but, but is there a God or not? Okay, Michael, you just True. brought up uh, paleontology and microbiology, and you said that those two converge to support this theory of evolution. Uh -huh. I've got a question for you. Do you think I could produce a list of published quotes from authorities in evolution who say that uh, it's difficult to find the evidence for evolution in the fossil record? Do you think I could produce a list of published I've quotes? I've seen Gish's list that he sends out to everybody. Yeah. No, I've got my own list. And well, okay. You have I don't know Gish. I've never met Gish. I've never heard him speak. But I have my own list. I have a question. Do you think I could, let's take, for example, flowering plants. Do you think I could provide a list from an authoritative evolutionist published who says that uh, the, the fossil record of the evolution of flowering plants is a, a mystery, and we do not know uh, from the fossil well, record enough. how it happened? If it's old enough, yeah. You can probably find somebody that says, you can find somebody that says anything. If it, the evolution it, of flowers, this is a done deal. We, we understand that now. No, no, no botanist is going to say it's a mystery. We don't know where flowers came from. This is pretty well understood now. Okay, okay. And if you found a quote from the 1950s or something, yeah, you can probably find somebody that said that. Okay, now that you, you've said that, what I want to do, it, it, uh, it should only take me a second here, I'm going to get you a quote on the, on the fossil record of the evolution of plants. All right, and let's agree that I won't use any quotes... Uh, uh, earlier than the 1950s. How about that? Okay. Okay, how about from 1993? 
in uh, Patterson, Williams, and Humphrey's Annual Review of Ecology, uh, page 170, the origin of angiosperms, that's flowering plants, was an, and they quote, an abominable mystery to Darwin, and it remained so 100 years later. I'll, I'll quote to you from Introduction to Paleo. Well, let's see. Let's Is that the end of that quote? That's the end of that quote. All right. So Darwin's 1859, so he said up to 100 years, so that's 1959. Well, this... Writing in 1993, why is he saying that? Because they don't present... You could you could look up Annual Review of Ecology and Systematics. I'll, I'll, this was written in 1993. You understand angiosperms quite well. Though. Okay, but but, but he, he wrote it in that way, maybe to give somebody a loophole out of his quote, but... <laughs> Uh, are you saying that you can quote a book for me that documents the, the fossil record of the evolution of flowering plants? Which book does that? Oh, you can look at any of uh, Gould's books. He does it nicely. I, I've read some of Gould's books, and I, I, I don't recall that, actually. Which book? Uh, there's a Could nice you name the title? Which book? Angiosperms in, uh, yeah, I'll give it to you here. got it right here. Um... Bully for Brontosaurus. You might check that out. Uh, that's not about flowering plants, I don't think. It's a collection of essays. It's about a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, which book of Gould's shows us the photographs and documents, the names of the fossils that show the development of flowering plants? Any uh, textbook on the evolution could, of uh, flowers, flowering plants, angiosperms, you'll see it. In if you could, you're an expert. If you could name one, I will go get the book and report back to the audience uh, because when this here was written in 1993... Let's get, let's get to the point here. All right. What, what, what is the point of all this? What, what are you trying to say? Well, I, I just happen to pick flowering plants. Evolution but, but, is, but, is but, a theory in trouble, and that, and that all these people that are professional evolutionary biologists, that what, what are they doing when they're working? Okay, do you think I, I could uh, quote from an expert on vertebrate uh, evolution saying that there is a... Granted. That there's a complete lack of transitional forms in the fossil record. Do you right. think I could quote an expert? If evolution is wrong, does that mean there's a God? No, but it makes your argument a, 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 a lot harder. So in other words, if, if A is wrong, that doesn't make B right. It just means A is wrong. Right, I agree with that. Uh, but, you, but you didn't. Do, do you think I could quote from an expert on vertebrate evolution saying that uh, that they cannot find on vertebrate evolution, that they have a backbone, that they cannot find transitional forms from invertebrates to vertebrates. I've got a quote in front of me from 1998, Alfred Fisher. I don't know if you've heard of him. And he... No. Okay, he's, he's written the article in Grolier uh, Encyclopedia, 1998. One of the most difficult problems has been the almost abrupt appearance of the major animal groups... In full-fledged form, this must reflect a sudden acquisition of skeletons by the various groups in itself a problem. How many groups suddenly, instantly appearing in the fossil record now have backbones, skeletons? Uh, do you think, Michael, that I'd have a hard time multiplying quotes by experts, authorities in the evolutionary field lamenting the lack of a fossil record for transitions? Let me ask you this. Are you that intensely interested in the science of evolutionary biology, or do you have some other agenda here? I, I, I grew up studying evolution. I believed in evolution, and I was confronted with the fact that evolutionary authorities were stating in every field that there was a lack of transitional fossils in their field. There's lots of transitional And I, be, I, I began... I in transitional fossils for its own sake. If you were, you'd go take, uh, study uh, paleontology... You're interested in it because you want to prove that your religion is correct, and evolution has nothing to do with religion. Well, um, it doesn't. It, it's a science. It has nothing to do with, with, with Christianity. I've got 1985 but, vertebrate history. None of the known fishes is thought to be directly ancestral to the earliest land vertebrates. All right. Fine. Um, and that those so what does that, this mean? Uh, the first, let's see. Most of them lived after the first amphibians appeared, and those that came before show no evidence of developing the stout limbs and ribs that characterize the primitive tetrapods. Uh, literally hundreds of quotes I have, Michael, from okay. authorities lamenting that they don't have the transitional forms in the fossil record, yet people tell the public 
that the fossil record is filled with transitional forms and we know it all. We know, like you're saying, I believe you're misrepresenting the fossil record of flowering plants that uh, you cannot have under the physical laws of the natural universe that matter nor energy can be created nor destroyed. The God is... The word God, G-O-D, is just a word to describe something you don't understand. Right, but let me give you a concept that there is something apart from the physical universe. God did it, and and me saying it did it. But you don't believe in God. You believe in the laws of the physical universe, but you have to believe in rocks that created themselves out of nothing and a fire or work activity that's continued forever. You've got to believe in one or the other of those things. And I'm saying that those two things are contradictory to the most fundamental laws of all the physical sciences. I created rocks. Where where, where did you get that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You read it in a book. Well, before... So how do you know the Bible's right? Philosophers and scientists... 4,000 years ago, how do you know it's right? Say that again? The the, the book upon which you're basing these beliefs was written 4,000 years ago. Right. You know it's right. When, When I first read that book, I didn't believe it. I thought it was incorrect. But what happened was I, I began to study science and evolution, and I thought that evolution, I saw that evolutionists showed me in their own writings that the evidence for evolution was not there. And then I started studying microbiology and reading books by microbiologists like uh, Dr. Lee Spetner. Maybe you, you remember him. He's the one who first published the mutation rates of various organisms. And he shows how there is, it violates the fundamental laws of microbiology to think that you could increase the information in, in, the, in the DNA of an organism. And there's no experimental evidence that it happens, and there's no theoretical evidence that it can happen. Let me ask you this. If, if I was to prove to you that evolution happened, would you quit being a Christian? Would you give it all up? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> if, if I was to prove to you that evolution did not happen, would you reconsider your understanding of origins? You're answering my question with a question? Right, I am. I'm curious about you. Just you. If I've answered that question on the air many times. If I found out that evolution was true, if I sh- was showed the evidence and then I was compelled to assent to it because it was it was clear and overwhelming, then I would have to rethink my belief in the Bible. I would rethink it. There's actually a lot of um, evolutionary biology. I understand that, but I'm interested in the truth. They're Christians. Yeah, I know. I know. So we, know we know that. Are they flawed in their thinking? How is I, I think they're flawed because they're ignoring the physical scientific evidence. Let me, let me ask you about Lucy. Right? Austral, uh, supposedly, we have Australopithecines in our ancient history going back a few million years. Uh-huh. Do you believe that? Uh, yes. Okay. Since now we've, the Human Genome Project and other organisms like an E. coli, uh, like uh, worms, we're, we're beginning to identify the entire chain of amino acids that make up an organism. And we can start to quantify the difference between human beings, Homo sapiens, and Australopithecine. And I have a question. Uh, Johansson said that Lucy lived about three million years ago. About two and a half million years ago. Yeah. Ha- have what? How many genetic changes are there between that creature and Homo sapien today? Not just genetic changes that matter. It's the interaction between genes, yeah, DNA, I, I agree, and proteins. I agree. That all makes it more complicated. I'm trying to keep it simple. Complex system. Do you do you think there are a few- now, for example, the difference between human genome? And the flatworm genome is 13,000 genes and 30,000 genes. So right. really, it's not just the genes that matter. Yeah, I, 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 under, I understand that. But my question to you is, are, is it of scientific interest to quantify what the percentage change or the actual number of uh, genetic differences 
between apes and human beings? Is that of scientific interest to know that? I'd like to get back to this. I don't no, no I, I'm, I'm going on a line of, th of thought, Michael, that I would really appreciate you to answer. I don't think you're interested. Unless, I'm very interested. I don't want to talk I, about science. I want to I, that, you know, we find that my audience knows that that's true of most evolutionists that come on this show. Let, let me make my point, and if you want to go on to another point, you can. I thought you wanted to talk about religion. And my, no, I want to talk about science. Hi. My point is that there have been millions, we now know that there have been millions of changes in the DNA from two and a half million years ago to today. Millions of changes. And evolutionists say we can't see evolution happening because it happens so slowly. And for those millions of changes to have occurred from Lucy to today's New York Post, we would have had to be on a, st a, a, a train, a locomotive of genetic mutations in a positive direction every year, uh, re reproducing themselves throughout the community at an incredibly blazing fast rate to okay. get from Lucy to today. That's not true. It's not true? Let's say, let's say you had a child who had a genetic improvement, and it would benefit the whole human race if it got to everybody. In a hundred years from now, how many people would have your your son's improved DNA? How would you get it to everybody? What are you talking about? Well, through when, when you reproduce and you have kids. And your son, then a generation later, has two kids. And so now two people have this improved genetic definition. And then a generation later, there might be four, and maybe seven, and then 11, work. 30, and 50, and... It doesn't work that way. Oh, it, it doesn't. That's not how genetics. That's not how a positive mutation gets there's, replicated through the community. Oh, there's lots of, of. Uh, you, you can't go. There's not a straight line from Lucy to us. It's it's a bush, in which lots of most of the lineages, well, in fact, all of them, but one went extinct. Yeah, but as as uh, all humans living today come from a single population. Yeah, creationists living argue that against Darwin. Right. The, years ago. the evolutionists said we were different races, and Darwin's racism came through in his writings. And the creationists quoted Luke in the book of Acts, saying we are all one family. I don't family. see much point in having this conversation, because you really don't understand what you're talking about. So we should talk about religion, because that's what you're into. You're not into science. I, religion. I, isn't that funny? I want to talk about science. No, you don't. <laughs> you think you do. You're pretending that you're interested in science, but you have an agenda. The point of your science is to find why it's wrong and support your belief in the Bible. If scientific evidence showed me there is no God, if I had strong evidence to that... How would you prove that? Well, I, I prove to you, you see, a, a, a rock cannot make itself from nothing. Therefore, by the laws of science... It says that a rock makes itself from nothing. You do. No, I don't. No scientist would ever say that. You, what are you talking about? You either believe one of these two things. Oh, you're wrong. That the universe has you're been here wrong. forever. Gonna, you're right there. I'm not going to let you go on. That is not correct. Okay. Not an either or choice. Do you believe the universe has been here forever, perpetually functioning in some way? No, I don't know. Nobody knows. Okay, you don't believe... No, no, no I didn't say that. I said nobody knows. Well, you first said no, and then you said nobody knows. Believe... Okay, listen. Listen. You're trying to trap me. You're playing these little word games. You creationists are so small-minded. Scientifically, show me how... My, okay, I'll state my argument in one sentence, and you could show me the, the scientific flaw in it. If the universe... If, if we state that the universe has been here functioning forever, we're violating the second law of how, thermodynamics. How would you ever prove that? If, forever we're is postulating it. We're saying, could the universe have been here functioning forever? And because of the increase in, in entropy and heat loss, I maintain that it couldn't be because there's still a lot of work getting done. Nobody says it's lived here forever. Who uh, says? Oh, okay, good. So we know that the universe is not perpetual and hasn't been oh, now, working forever. What do you mean by the universe? Everything that exists in the physical world. It could be other world. universes. Let's. I think you have a hard enough time dealing with ours. Can we limit yeah, the ours? Bubble, you, don't you know about inflationary cosmology and multiple bubble universes? Yeah, or, and I also know about Casper the Friendly Ghost. True, from Big Bang to Big Crunch to Big Bang. I also know about Casper the Friendly Ghost, and I'd like to talk about scientific laws that are well established. I have. There's now some experimental evidence that there are these multiple bubble universes. That's not true. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Very interesting. No, it's not true. Yes, it is. That's it's very, very interesting that there are these other multiple universes. There's experimental evidence that they exist. 
uh, they are starting to do some tests to show. You just said there's experimental evidence that bubble universes exist. Quantum uh, computing, for example. Would you like to correct that statement, certain, Michael? Certain things uh, can happen only if there are uh, other universes in existence. Mm. Interesting, huh? Now, look, so here's the deal, is that nobody is saying that the universe uh, just came into existence, um, uh, you know, always on its own, has always been there. Nobody says that. Uh, okay, nobody Mike. knows what there was before the universe. Okay, Michael, let's try to see what we agree on scientifically. Where did God come from? Y you and I agree. Okay, now, let me ask you this. No, Michael, I Michael, you and I agree scientifically that the universe is not perpetual. Hey, Mr. Science, where did God come Look, we're dealing here with some of the ultimate questions that cannot be answered. They're insoluble. I, I think they can be answered. You can answer. You've just admitted logical defeat. If you want to, if you want to believe all this stuff, you can. It's if I want to believe the first two laws of thermodynamics, and that's yeah, but I do believe them. Do you? Most scientists do not accept the arguments you're making. So either you're right and they're all wrong, or you're wrong. Well, there are there wrong. are thousands of scientists who do believe, including, by the way, Lord Kelvin uh, well, and James Joule, who, it, who gave them. us the laws of thermodynamics. They agree with my interpretation. You've got to catch up. You're way behind. We've learned a lot in the last hundred years. Yeah, but okay, this, then take from what we've learned and scientifically refute my argument. Okay, I'm going to go. This is a waste of my time. Okay. Uh, I think it went very well. I think it went very well. He's pretty much at the top of the evolutionary food chain in America. He's right up there. And when he said, when I asked him uh, how long before the genetic improvement, the mutation in your son, uh, got to the whole population, in 20 years, how many people would have that improvement? In 100 years, in 1,000 years. You know, I asked him that because... If you take a population of, say, 10 million or so, it, which is pretty small, and you have a mutation, it's going to take about 20,000 generations among apes, 20,000 generations before that one mutation could permeate through the whole population. And here he said the whole human race is from one genetic source, just from one. So that it, if, if we have... 5 million genetic differences between us and Lucy, Australopithecus, we have 5 million genetic changes in 2.5 million years. And if it's going to take 20,000 generations, or let's say 400,000 years, for one genetic change to go from Lucy to everybody in the population, almost a half a million years, well, that could only happen five or six times. You cannot get 5 million genetic changes in that short period of time. And he saw, that was, that, he saw where that was going. And he said, oh, evolution is not a straight line, it's a bush. That has nothing to do with genetic mutations as a source of evolution. That's what they believe. But they believe that that didn't happen one time, it happened 10,000 times, and only one has survived, which is a lot more difficult to cause to happen. So I, I enjoyed it. I think it went well. We thought he might stick with us for five minutes, and we got about 40 out of him. So we, he exceeded our expectations for a leading evolutionist. He didn't quite hang in there, though, with the, with the likes of Eugenie Scott, who sat with a cat on her lap for a full hour, not debating Bob Enyard on the subject of evolution. Because as she said at the end of the show, and we agreed with her, Bob, I don't debate. Eugenie, that's obvious. Uh, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll, uh, let's flag that tape. We'll, we'll, we'll mark it for our apologetic series that we may put together sometime here. This is Bob Enyart reminding you to do right and risk the consequences. Now whatever you do, with all of your mind. 